Good evening. Welcome to the 2023 Mannequin Clark Lecture presented by the Institute for Islamic, Christian, and Jewish Studies in Baltimore, Maryland. I am Heather Miller Rubens, the Executive Director and Roman Catholic Scholar for ICJS. Thank you all for being here with us tonight, both in person here at Northside Baptist Church of Baltimore and with the hundreds of people watching online via YouTube Live. Welcome to everyone. I would like to begin tonight by acknowledging this extremely painful moment and the overwhelming violence in Israel and Gaza that has touched so many of us in a personal way. Let us pause for a moment of silence on behalf of all those who have died, those who are held captive, those who are suffering, and those who are grieving and fearful. Thank you. Times like these highlight the importance and the challenges of interreligious engagement. The ICJS Mannequin Clark Lecture reminds us that an interreligious society is forged on the basis of resilient friendships, friendships that cross lines and defy social expectations. Bernie Mannequin, one of the founding Jewish trustees of the ICJS, was a man who became entangled in the lives of those that he came to know and to love. And Bernie's affections were not limited by religious affiliation. Jim Clark, a Presbyterian Christian, was a builder who wanted to change the inner as well as the outer landscape of urban America. Jim and Bernie entered into each other's orbits and the gravitational pull of their bond was unbreakable. A lifelong friendship was forged and while neither Bernie nor Jim are with us on this earth, the Mannequin Clark Lecture bears witness to their deep and their resilient interreligious friendship. We are fortunate to have with us both here in the auditorium and online members of the Mannequin and the Clark families. I want to thank and acknowledge you all for coming to honor Bernie and Jim and the power of interreligious friendships to be a force for good in our communities. The Mannequin Clark Lecture is an expression of Bernie and Jim's belief that we belong to one another despite our differences, that people of all faiths or no faith can challenge one another to live in ways that deepen our respective commitments, strengthen our communities, and respect the dignity of every person. Like Bernie and Jim, ICJS loudly affirms the following claim, that building the interreligious society is a necessary project. Before I turn to our featured speaker, I'd like to offer our thanks and gratitude to our gracious hosts here from Northside Baptist Church and to introduce Northside's pastor, the Reverend Walter L. Parrish III, who will offer a few words of welcome. Reverend Parrish. Emphasis on few. <laughs> we are grateful to have been asked to host this evening. We are strategically positioned, we believe, as a church that is determined to empower people to live changed lives. We are grateful to be a church that is multiracial, multiethnic, and completely diverse. I believe Dr. Thurman would be pleased that you are here tonight. Welcome. Thank you. Before we proceed, I want to convey a couple of logistical things. Um, I'd like to point out the location of the emergency exits. If the need arises, you can safely exit the sanctuary through the doors you entered in, and that will lead directly outside. Following tonight's lecture, we welcome you to join us for some coffee, cookies, and conversation in the fellowship hall, which is located down the hallway to the left as you leave the sanctuary. And finally, I'd like to let you know that following Dr. Fluker's remarks, 
we will have a question and answer session. All viewers, both in the room and online via YouTube, can ask questions by using the online tool Slido. On the screen now are instructions for how you can access this tool. You do not need to download the app. You can just use any browser and go to slido.com. And when you see the message that asks if you're going to join as a participant, type in our event code for this evening, which is 355-9886. Then just type your question into the open box on the screen. You can submit a question at any point during the lecture. You can upvote questions that you've seen someone else put into it because all the questions, both online and in person, will be available for you to see. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible in the Q&A period. And now it is my great honor to introduce our Mannequin Clark lecturer, Dr. Walter Earl Fluker. Dr. Fluker is an internationally recognized expert on the life and teaching of renowned theologian and civil rights icon, Howard Thurman. Today, he is a distinguished professor of the Howard Thurman Center at Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. From 2020 to 2023, he served as the professor of spirituality, ethics, and leadership at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University and as Professor Emeritus and the former Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Ethical Leadership at the Boston University School of Theology, where he served as the editor of the Howard Thurman Papers Project. Dr. Fluker is the author of many books, including The Unfinished Search for Common Ground, Reimagining Howard Thurman, which is available for purchase tonight, thanks to our friends at the Ivy Bookshop right outside the sanctuary. We invited Dr. Fluker to serve as this year's Mannequin Clark Lecturer because we knew he could speak to the interreligious opportunity we have in these perilous times, when democratic norms and pluralistic values cannot be taken for granted. Steeped in the thought of Howard Thurman, Dr. Fluker challenges us to wake up running and imagine new visions of connectedness and collaboration as we work to safeguard our democracy and build interreligious communities. As Dr. Fluker wrote in the introduction to the Search for Common Ground, quote, with the rise of religious activism in the nation's highest court and the rampant rage and violence incited by Christian nationalism, Thurman's religious search for democratic space, especially at this moment in the history of this nation and the globe, should be given equal par with social, political, and global contestations that seek common ground because the potential consequences of failing to do so could be devastating. I also recently learned that Dr. Fluker was awarded the Roosevelt Institute Four Freedoms Award, um, specifically for worship. And this was just happened in September, and it's a wonderful recognition of uh, an amazing uh, uh, lifetime of learning and, and teaching. And so I'd like to welcome Dr. Fluker. Thank you so very much. Those were some very lovely words. I only wish my beloved had been here to hear all of these and to know the fine work that I'm doing in the world. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have a few notes that I don't want to miss. Let me read these, and I'm highly improvisational. Sometimes the text works for me, but when I'm enshrouded with people who are in darkness, <laughs> whom I cannot see, I become highly suspicious, <laughs> nervous. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, you know what I'm saying? Greetings to all of you who have gathered here, both in this wonderful congregation and online at the Northside Baptist Church, pastored by my very good friend, Walter Parrish, whom I know who and his father, and some people just come from great stock and they represent well. You represent not only this tradition, but also your alma mater, Morehouse College. God bless you for having us. Applause 
I would also like to personally acknowledge my appreciation to Dr. Heather Miller Rubens, the executive director. I appreciate the introduction, but I must tell you that I'm just in love with your staff. They demonstrate what I call radical hospitality. And uh, that's not everywhere. And I'd like to thank them along with you for making this moment possible. I'm also mindful of my predecessors in this lecture who are a tall oaks in the field. And to be honored in such a way for me is, is a moment of humility. I learned from Howard Thurman that humility is not a liability, but it may be the very doorstep to God. And finally, to the Mannequin and Clark families, both here and online, please allow me to extend my own gratitude to you as we begin running. Let's get started. I'd like to read a poem, a very recent poem by Aurora Levins Morales. She's a Puerto Rican writer and activist. It's called Summons. Last night I dreamed 10,000 grandmothers from the 1,200 corners of the earth walked out into the gap one breath deep between the bullet and the flesh, between the bomb and the family. They told me we cannot wait for governments. There are no peacekeepers boarding planes. There are no leaders who dare to say every life is precious, so it will have to be us. They said, we will cup our hands around each heart. We will sing the earth's song, the song of water, a song so beautiful that vengeance will turn to weeping. The mourners will embrace and grief replace every impulse toward harm. 10,000 is not enough, they said. So we have sent this dream like a flock of doves into the sleep of the world. Wake up, put on your shoes. You who are reading this, I'm bringing bandages and a bag of scented guavas from my trees. I think I remember the time and the tune. Meet me at the corner. Let's go. Wake up running. In this lecture, I'm returning to a project that I began in 2016 after the publication of The Ground Has Shifted. Here I was mostly concerned with the black church tradition of which I'm a part. And I was asking my church to awaken to a new rhythm and time for black diasporic and exiled bodies. I argued that we must take seriously the shifts in social, political, theological, ethical, and spiritual aesthetic movements. I'm a scholar, so I had to use all of those words. <laughs> but these traditions, I argued, have in many ways become calcified and ineffective due to our longstanding ideological and cultural inheritances we are unable to speak to the significant national and global challenges and provocations that are part of our own struggles for equity, justice, and belonging. Therefore, I proposed a pragmatic strategy using Martin Buber's language of turning, turning, 
Turning from dilemma, I ask to diasporas. Turning from exodus to exiles. And to use my mama's language, turning from the frying pan to the fire. Whenever we got in trouble with mama, she said, now you done jumped from the frying pan to the fire. The frying pan represented the perpetual lake of fire in which exiled black bodies burned day and night forever and forever. The fire, however, refers to the Holy Ghost. I didn't say Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost. Because I think the ghost that we are working against is so shrewd, so dangerous, that it's going to take another ghost, a Holy Ghost. So I suggested that the latter, the turning to the Holy Ghost, and far means that we accept our heritage and mission to constructively engage our diasporic and exilic conditions and to identify with the scattered and scattering peoples around the globe. Thus, I ask my readers to consider a rela related threefold method of congregating, conjuring, and conspiring in commons at the crossings. So if you don't learn anything else tonight, you're going to learn this and its rhythm. Repeat after me, congregating, congregating. Conjuring, conjuring, and conspiring, and conspiring. In, commons in commons at crossings. At this I recommended for the future of the black church. And the black church is a lot like love. It's a many splendored and splintered thing. But I needed to speak out of my own tradition because again, Heather, you must be somewhere before you're everywhere. I further argued that the primary locus for these theological and ethical futures can best be realized by paying attention to our youth and joining and fashioning with them new theological and ethical visions of leadership that extend beyond the sequestered boundaries of U.S. territorialism and loyalties to the state. And to see ourselves as global citizens in a reconstructed world house. In order to accomplish these ends, I propose that we must wake up the dead. That's what I ask, and the ground has shifted. How do we wake up the dead? Somebody recently critiqued me. They said, a black church isn't dead, and I didn't say that. I just want to go on record. I didn't say that. But we do need to wake up the dead. <laughs> In order to accomplish these ends, tonight I'm saying we must wake up running. And you should know, I've been working on this in various places, and I'll spare you all of those places where I've lectured. But this is an important conversation. To wake up running, my friends, involves reimagining what I call democratic space. First, I view democracy as an imperfect, finite, finite human and political construction that reflects a deep inner spiritual quest for infinite freedom. There is something in us that just wants to be free, all of us. And before I'd be a slave, I'd be very, we know the deep freedom. It also is a quest for ultimate meaning, personal assurance, and a sense of what Howard Thurman called ultimate security, knowing somehow even beyond death we are held. It's democracy then is a quest for this infinite freedom that holds intention 
what some call the precariousness of human existence. And I explained that in some very uncertain terms to my group today. But stuff happens in this life. You can walk down the street chewing bubble gum and trip and fall into another world. Things happen. That's precarious. But there are some other things that happen that are not necessarily precarious. There are things that make us vulnerable. Systems that fail us. Politicians and leaders who lie to us. There are people, clandestine puppeteers who hide behind the curtains of social fiction, who manipulate the mindscape, and they lie. That's precarity that makes us vulnerable. And so many of the people we know who are not here are in very vulnerable situations, and they live lives Howard Thurman says, of no contest. They can't fight back. They can only fear. So this lecture then is influenced by my work with Howard Thurman really over the past 40 years, who saw democracy as a social, political, spiritual, and ethical construct. He, he was an incredible thinker. And most people think of Thurman basically as the nice guy who wrote the meditations of the heart or deep is the hunger or Jesus and the disinherited. But our Howard Thurman Papers Project identified over 58,000 documents written over the course of his lifetime. And there are probably more out there. And we could only publish 7% of all of that to make it available to the public. So you're dealing with a prodigious intellect who is spiritually rooted in a certain tradition. He goes back to the traditions of enslaved Africans and asks hard questions about what does this mean for me in my time. So Thurman believed deeply that the practices of the inner life prepared individuals and collectives for transformative engagement in society in the construction of what I'm calling democratic space. Is everybody still with me? Since I can't see you, <laughs> are you awake? <laughs> Creating democratic space refers to the ongoing struggle against miscounting. Miscounting, the reconfiguration of space and the reordering of time for vulnerable bodies. When you hear chants that are so prevalent now across social media, this is the reordering of time, going back to a long nostalgic past that never existed. For Thurman, miscounting meant, and I quote, to be ignored, to be passed over as of no account and of no meaning, to be made into a faceless thing not a man or a human. And he added, for those who are miscounted, it is to act with no accounting, to go nameless up and down the streets of other minds where no salutation greets and no sign is given to mark the place one calls one's own. That's from a strange freedom meditation. So creating and cultivating democratic space for Thurman signals something more than personal fulfillment and nurture of the individual's contemplative life. Rather, it spoke to the very fiber of democratic life and its promise embodied in the interrelated notions of freedom and equality of dignity and worth. It also required the hard work of preparation, cultivating a sense of presence, and engaging in practices that assured continued devotion and development of the inner life. Worldly speech, affection, action, and faith in the construction of democratic space. 
Thurman's teaching and ministerial positions as professor, pastor, university chaplain, and his later work with the Howard Thurman Educational Trust served as spiritual and intellectual laboratories where his vision of community as democratic space could be tested, revised, and reimagined. Here, my friends, this is not just your everyday preacher, and I like everyday preachers, but he is also akin to a scientist in a laboratory experimenting with the human spirit in spaces that he wants to see become more equal, equitable, representative, where people count and are not invisible. So, with the rise of what he called in 1944 fascist masquerades that have secured squatters' rights in our religious institutions and practices, Thurman's unfinished religious search for democratic space, especially at this moment in our history, in the history of this nation and around the globe, should be given equal attention. That's where I am, Heather. So at the end of this essay in the unfinished search, which was mentioned, I take up this question. And this is our question tonight. What might Howard Thurman's creative construction of democratic space for subjugated bodies mean for our times. Thurman, for those who don't know Thurman, talked about the search for common ground. What might it mean for our times, for vulnerable bodies? Let's get busy. I won't bore you with all of the methodological questions I'm asking here of myself. But I'm going to ask you to think in two great big ways, patterns. And I'm going to ask you to repeat this too so that I know you're awake. It's very important that we stay awake. You agree? <laughs> Can you say remembering and retelling and reliving our stories? <laughs> so I'm going to ask us tonight to remember. And to remember has to do with memory and history. To remember the past, to memorialize in some ways the past, and to correct it sometimes with history. Remembering. We not only remember looking at the past, we also retell our stories. We reframe them. We go to the past and we come back and we look for the future in vision. This would be a great thing for churches and synagogues and temples, by the way. Remember your story. And then envision a future as you retell the story and then you relive it in the present. So you're really doing memory, vision, and mission. I'm interested tonight really in mission, but I'd just like to take you through a few stories that you remember and retell to inform mission. Everybody with me? You know I'm black and Baptist, so I have to hear amen or something. Okay, 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 good, good. Yeah, good, good, I can feel it, I can feel it. The other one I shared with you, can you remember congregating? Das ist gut, ja, sehr gut, yes. Congregating, conjuring, conspiring, in commons at crossings. Now, if you get that, we're on our way home. So I want to get started. Let me do this so that uh, I often lose. I think I got this right. Yep. No, you moved it for I never know where I am. Well, I think I have it. Yeah, I've done all of that. Good. Like creatures of the African savanna, we must wake up running every morning. 
The gazelle runs to avoid becoming breakfast for some pride of lions, and the lions run to feed their family. Every creature in the savanna wakes up running because of the precariousness of existence. And I'm suggesting tonight, so must we. However, there is more at stake than implied in this predator-prey dynamic of waking up running from the predator in order not to be the prey and sometimes being the predator and looking for prey. There's more at stake in running. We must not run in fear, but in faith towards the other and the good futures that we can only imagine. This is a decidedly spiritual undertaking. For Thurman, these are two interdependent yet contending forces at work that set us on the run. One is the day-to-day -day need for self-preservation in which what he calls life feeds on itself. Everywhere you see life, he says, life is hungry and it's feeding on itself. This instinctive drive for survival, self-nourishment, results in the human condition of a perpetual war of all against all that issues forth in fear, deception, and hate and the sequestering of democratic space. On the other hand, he thinks there is something within us which desires to be in relation with the source of all life and with the other in acts of creation, connection, and compassion that are integral to vibrant democratic living. Both forces are part of the dynamic principle of what he calls the aliveness of life. So, you know, I'm alive. Pastor Parrish is alive, Fido is alive, but you know Pastor Parrish and Walter Fluker and Fido will pass on, but they'll still, there'll be another Walter Parrish, and life is alive, he said. And it's the most simple ob observation, he says, that we often miss, that life is lifing. <laughs> to illustrate the significance of the work of Thurman, he suggests that the journey into the aliveness of life begins within, where we notice it within. To illustrate the significance of this inward search, in one of his earliest published sermons entitled Keep Awake, he tells the story of the Indian musk deer on the run. I quote him. It is said that in the springtime, the musk deer is haunted by the odor of musk. He seeks it everywhere. There are times when the questing becomes terrible in his agony. He runs over hills, jumping streams and rivulets with his nostrils dilating and his body aching with desire, confident that around the next turning, he will discover musk the object of his quest. This goes on until at last he falls exhausted with his tiny head resting on his still more tiny hoofs to discover that the odor of musk is in his own hide. Go where you will, he declares with Tagore, from Benares to Mathura, if you have not found your own soul, the world is unreal to you. This inward journey is also a quest for self-transcendence. Do you ever look at yourself while you're being yourself? <laughs> Thurman thought you could. You know, look at yourself. Thurman agrees with Martin Buber that in each of us there is a cascade ego a bird that flies higher when soaring the narrow gorge than the highest soarer above the plains because the gorge is in the mountains. He says to give this eagle wings is the call to every person. 
But this quest for self-transcendence must be grounded in the everyday traffic of human affairs where decisions are made about how we live together and nurture one another. Thus, for Thurman, democratic space will always inhabit the narrow ridge between what is possible and impossible. This is both a spiritual and ethical enterprise which requires agency, engagement, connection, and imagination. In the words of another great mystic, Thomas Merton, who challenges us with this question, what negligence, what delay is this, he asked, run to the mountain and get rid of the sloth which keeps you from seeing God. I love that quote. The perennial past. I think I got it right. Is that the right slide? I'm doing so good. I'm so proud. Do you see me, honey? I'm doing good. <laughs> the past. Memory. Memory. History. Memory. Remembering and retelling. Running, runagate, resistance, and reconstruction. Let us remember. There are excellent precedents in our own histories and memories of waking up running. Running holds great spiritual significance in various religions and spiritual practices. You might want to reflect upon your own traditions while we think together and remember stories about running. I know Dr. Fatima Fanuzzi loves running. For example, there is the story of the marathon monks of Japan. They are a group of Buddhists who strive for spiritual enlightenment through extreme physical endurance. Their rituals are truly remarkable. Over a span of seven years, these monks run and pray for 100 days each year. During their runs, they stop at different stations to recite prayers and perform chants. After completing each day's marathon, they engage in temple cleaning and continue praying until late evening. The next day, the ritual begins anew. Think about it, 100 days. If a monk is unable to complete the 100-day ritual, they are obligated to commit honorable suicide. This demanding practice puts even the Boston Marathon to shame. <laughs> I'm not asking you all to do that tonight. But you might want to know that some people take running seriously. <laughs> I do. Because contemplative running is also a liberative practice. African American history, religion, and culture are filled with examples of running as a liberating practice. As in running away from social, ideological, material bondage and violence to new futures of freedom, connection, healing, and transformation. The idea of runagate conveys this idea. It is a term made popular by the black poet Robert A. Hayden, who was at Fisk University for many years, in his 1962 poem, Runagate, Runagate. This is on the legendary runaway Harriet Tubman. Listen to Hayden. Runs, falls, rises, stumbles on from darkness into darkness and darkness thicketed with shapes of terror and the hunters pursuing and the hounds pursuing and the night cold and the night long and the river to cross and the jack moo lanterns beckoning, beckoning and blackness ahead and when shall I reach that somewhere morning and keep on going and never turn back and keep on going. Runagate, runagate, runagate. 
According to biblical scholar and cultural critic Vincent Wimbush, who bears your name, Alicia, the term runagate is an absolute, is, a, is an alternative uh, form of renegade, re, as in renegade, or in the Middle Latin, renegatus, meaning fugitive or runaway. It has come to carry the meaning, Wimbush says, of a more transgressive act than flight. It is maroonage, running away with an attitude and a plan taking flight in a body, but even more importantly, in terms of consciousness. Other historical figures represented in this trope of African-American history and experience include the likes of your Baltimorean, Frederick Douglass, or Omar bin Said, who was captured as a slave from his beautiful West African country of Senegal, as we call it now, and was trapped in a North Carolina jail and started writing in Arab <laughs> on the walls. Runagates. They revealed the dangers, determination, terrors, crossings, moods, and strategies of enslaved Africans who escaped the master's house in pursuit of freedom both freedom of the body and the liberation of consciousness through the birth of subjectivity, running away from and running to something strange and dangerous, yet not yet realized, but imagined as a new future, a new situation, a new being, a new way of interpreting the world, a world where one is saved from the horrors of enslavement of the body, mind, and spirit. Like Douglas Tubman, Saeed and the 100,000 enslaved Africans who escaped to freedom mostly to Canada, we are called, we are called, we are called, we are called to run errands of resistance that are part of our existence as runaways and to search for new visions and read them within what Howard Thurman called the divine context. I'm just halfway through the lecture now, so if you need to, if you need to move around now, you should do that. You good? Good. At Morehouse, I used to let the young men stand up in the middle of the lecture and scream if they were tired, because I know that you cannot sleep if you scream. You always wake yourself up. So you're welcome to do that tonight if you... For Thurman, those who wake up running must also watch and observe the signs of the time. In 1956, he wrote an incredible essay, an exposition on the prophet Habakkuk. I always pause when I get to Habakkuk because when I was a young preacher, the first, second sermon I preached was from Habakkuk. And I told him, I said, this morning I'm talking to you from the text of Habakkuk. <laughs> so I'm, I'm always mindful when I get there. So if I stumble, you understand. Thurman in 1956 does this exposition for the Interpreter's Bible. Great Protestant organ for preachers. He's the first African-American, of course, to do it. But enough said of that. But he writes it. And in his exposition, he joins the running herald who proclaims this message. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. And the word comes back to the prophet. Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that the herald may run with it. For the vision awaits its appointed time. It speaks to the end and will not prove false, though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. I wish we had time for that. But the point is, more is expected of the runner than running away. 
She must return like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and all these other folks we know, like Eli Wazell, must return and prophesy and publish the disenchanting yet hopeful news that freedom will take much longer than we thought and that it will come not by a magical hand of fate but only because we continue to struggle, resist, reconstruct, and reimagine our futures as we run toward our destinies as sons and daughters of God. Thurman captures this idea of resistance in this oft-quoted poem by Stephen Crane. He says, I saw a man pursuing the horizon. Round and round they sped. I was disturbed at this. I accosted the man. It is futile, I said. You can never. You lie, he said, and ran on. Or in the words of that Sufi poet and seer, Jalal bin Muhammad Rumi, he says, run from what's comfortable. Forget safety. Live where you fear to live. Destroy your reputation. Be notorious. I have tired of prudent planning. I'm trying it too long. From now on, I'll be mad. <laughs> Don't you love Rumi? Almost there. Did I get my slide? Did you see that move? Okay, I, smooth, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, there are some days, I'm from Chicago, South Side. I'm so cool, my clothes look nervous on me. I just, uh, <laughs> you know, Barack Obama, you see him jump off that helicopter, that little, he didn't learn that in Hawaii, or <laughs> Southern California, or New York, or even in Indonesia, he didn't learn. That's South Side, South Side. The precarious present, past, present. We're revisiting now, looking at vision and mission. What is it that we must do? Dr. Rubens, what is it that we must do as we move into this new phase that challenges interreligious dialogue and practice? Reimagining and reliving democratic space. How do we do it? Who are the runners, watchers for us? Who are these watching runners or running watchers, one of the two? What is the internal dialogue between the watcher and runner who is called to prophesy? What might the watcher be saying to the runner? These are not different things, personalities. They're alternate or alternating consciousness. I don't know how you pluralize conscience. Can you? Yeah, 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 you got my point, all right? If I say conscious, I'll, I'll, I'll splatter all over myself. What might they be saying to one another? And what might the runner be saying to the watcher and the watcher say to the runner? How do we construct our religious and theological worlds without falling into a dichotomous conundrum that renders us, our congregations, our synagogues, our mosques, our temples, and religious institutions, and ecclesiastical hierarchies, immobile, fixated, and powerless in this terrible moment that threatens interreligious efforts to address war and violence in our global, national, and local communities? Let that sink, because we spend so much time with text, traditions, what the word says, the scriptures. Help me, Holy Ghost. What might an attempt at an embodied, unified consciousness look like for us who must read, write, run, and prophesy? as we imagine a new moment of embodied spiritual discourse and ethical practices for our time? How might we escape the privileged, abstract, 
Manichaean, I heard being mentioned today, theological conversations about dogma and doctrine and live at the same time concretely in history. That's deep. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's deep. <laughs> now turn to him and say, I have no idea how to do that. Write the vision, make it plain, so that he who is running, she who is running, they who are running may see it. How do we proceed from memory, the past, in our respective traditions to the future vision to better understand our missions in the precarious present? Well, I suggest that we make a run for it. <laughs> Otis Redding had a good song back in the 60s, and I don't want to bore you, but I do need a little more of your time, so I'm trying to create some space for myself. Time. He, had a little, he had a little gig in the 60s. He said, preacher and the deacon were praying one day. Along came a bear coming down the way. Preacher told the deacon to say a prayer. He said, Lord, a prayer won't kill this bear. We got to run for it. I suggest we make a run for it, and we begin by congregating. Can you finish that sentence? Okay, I'm going to move real quick here so we can talk. I'm always aware of time. What time did I start? A quarter after? So I'm way into this text, so let's just do this. So congregating. What do, do I mean by congregating? And I'm borrowing this from Thurman, and I'll make reference to Thurman at appropriate places, but mainly I want you to get the idea. Congregating. You could call it a gerund, right? I learned that in grammar school. But I just want it to be a verb, period, fluid. And I know a gerund kind of captures a verb, but I don't want to capture it, right? It's fluid. Congregating signals gathering, binding, and coming together. It involves running away from and running to new imagined futures. Religious leaders, scholars, and congregations, Jumas, Pujas, synagogues, and all, have excellent opportunities to begin this work by acknowledging and receiving the voices and visions of the new movement of the spirit that is in our midst. Congregating in this contemporary context involves running to by creating and appreciating spaces of difference. What Octavia Butler called hyper empathy, respect and justice taking in different forms and styles of emergent leadership where the socially and politically disrespected, dismissed, excluded, impure, and grotesque can gather in our diasporic and exilic quest for home. You know, the people you just make you, that just make you sick to look at, that are not part of your, your criterion for purity. Congregating, then, is invitational and involves radical hospitality for the other. That's all Thurman was doing with the Fellowship Church people, and we can talk about it, but he really, he brought all of these various people. The church was founded not by Howard Thurman nor by Alfred Fisk, but a group of white women who were part of the community in this little college, I'm forgetting, right outside of San Francisco, Mills College, during the great expulsion of Japanese. And they took on the name of a family that was evacuated from their home and placed in pens. They called themselves the Sakai Group. They started the movement. All white women. <clears throat> <laughs> I, that's all I'm going to say about them. Just hold that out there. I'm, I'm, 
what would conjuring look like when we come together? What would conjuring look like? Congregating is related to conjuring. And I'm not just talking about the medicine woman or man. Or the, I, I'm good with that. I, I love these Sangomas and medicine folks. I, just, I spend a lot of time with they do some stuff, y'all. Put some on you, too. You have to be careful. <laughs> but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how do you take the, the materials that experience gives you at hand and refashion new tools to attend to the need at hand. What would that look like in interreligious practice? I'll give you a quick example. I flew in from Boston to Atlanta one day a few years ago, and I went to the garage, and my garage was there. My car was there, and I was just grateful, and I jumped in the car because I was going to a meeting, and lo and behold, the car went start. I won't tell you what I was saying. It wasn't nice. Because I know one of my kids or somebody had borrowed the car. I think it was my nephew. And I was just, I was telling him what I thought and despairing at the same time, knowing I wouldn't make it to the meeting. And in drives a good old boy in a red pickup truck down in Atlanta, y'all. Big old tr pickup truck. The, p the truck was big as my garage almost. And he drove up, and I said, what are you doing here? He said, your wife wanted me to cut down that tree in the backyard. I said, oh, yeah. I said, by the way, do you have jumper cables? He said, no, nobody uses jumper cables. I said, oh, Lord. And, you know, my manhood, all of that stuff was at stake. And he said, you don't have any? I said, no, I don't have them either. He said, well, what is that over there in the corner? And he saw these jumper cables that had been sitting there for several centuries. And, uh, <laughs> and he went over and he took them and he scraped the calcium off and he, you know, he put it on and it didn't start. And then he did some other stuff. He was conjuring. And then in a few minutes, <clears throat> car was gone. I said, sir, you are a bricolure. He said, what? I say, you, you take things that have been thrown away and you refashion them into things that are useful. What if we went back into these traditions and appropriated some things that still matter and reconfigured them into tools of what Thurman called the spirit? I only have one more little, no, two. And then we begin to conspire. We conspire not in a diabolical plot, kind of like we see with some of our politicians. I'm not calling any names, but a lot of conspiracies going on. But I'm talking about in the literal sense of in spirit with the other, conspiratus, breathing literally with the other. Can we find ourselves in a place that is so close to the other and to that which you call holy that you even breathe the same breath? To do as one, to swear an oath, make a covenant, to run together. In commons, I take Thurman's common ground and I pluralize it. I make it plural. I'm not sure we have a common ground now. Do you? I mean, maybe you do. Maybe you already have figured it out. Maybe you really do know everything. I know that you're probably right. But experience is not saying that nowadays. The empirical evidence is that there are many opinions, many worlds, and many challenges that collide at the intersection of our day-to-day -day lives with terrible systems that are fragile and broken, and we're trying to figure it out. What about commons, people? What about the possibility that regular people like you, me, get together with the brick allure in my garage and figure this out? I think if you ask Thurman, he'd be the first to say nearly every great revolution doesn't necessarily begin with the big thinkers in the libraries. We must do it at crossings, and I'm almost there. Now, this is it. This is it. 
And if I had time, I would stay here forever. But crossings, when people are on the run, they are crossing over at borders, places where there are no trespassing signs on every side. They're going into forbidden territory without a map. And crossings, therefore, emerge as very dangerous sites. Thurman had a favorite hymn, Deep River, my home is over Jordan. Lord, I want to cross over campground. This idea of crossing, let's talk about it when we sit down, means that when we get to places of ambiguity and contingency, and we're not sure where we are while we are conspiring together in commons and looking for ways to conjure as we congregate. On the run, we go across crossings, and we say to one another, see over there the path to the river. No, the path that crosses the river. Or is it the river crossing the path? Who knows? One must be careful, however, at crossings. For while they bring information, knowledge, and possibility, they are always fraught with dangers, perils, and crucifixions. For we do not know who or what goes there and where to set our feet on shifting grounds. We will not be able to get this done, people, until we're willing to make a step. I close with this reading from Olive. Schreiner, a huge influence on Howard Thurman, a South African writer who was really British, whom I hear smoked like a chimney and cussed like a sailor, but was one of the most beautiful spiritual allegorical writers I've ever read. And Thurman loved her so much, he actually took all of her writings that he could find and put them in a little reader called The Track to the Water's Edge. And it's from that that I want you to just pause for a minute and listen. This is from Three Dreams in the Desert. Schreiner is writing about a woman who is seeking the land of freedom, and she's at the crossings. And she meets an aged man who personifies reason. Reason points her to the land of freedom which is beyond the dark flowing river, she says. He informs her that the journey will involve great suffering and sacrifice. The woman has to leave her child, which symbolizes the oppression of women for Sreiner. And she makes a track to the water's edge. Finally, she reaches the bank of the river and she says to the old man, Reason, for what do I go to this land, this far land, which no one has ever reached? Oh, I'm alone. I'm utterly alone. And Reason, that old man, said to her, Silence. What do you hear? And she listened intently, and she said, I hear a sound of feet a thousand times, ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, and they beat this way. He said, they are the feet of those that shall follow you. Lead on. Make a track to the water's edge. Where you stand now, the ground will be beaten flat by ten thousand times, ten thousand feet. And he said, have you seen the locusts, how they cross a stream? First one comes down the water edge, and it is swept away. And the other comes, and then another, and then another. And at last, with their bodies piled up, a bridge is built, and the rest pass over. And she said, and of those that come first, some are swept away and are heard of no more. Their bodies do not even build the bridge. 
and are swept away and are heard of no more. And what of that, he said? They make a track to the water's edge. They make a track to the water's edge. And she said, over that bridge, which shall be built with our bodies, who will pass? He said, the entire human race. Thank you. I now join Heather Rubin with questions and answers, right? Thank you. This is me again. Cool. You're so cool, you make your clothes look nervous. Cool. Uh, first, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much for that um, and for the call to, to wake up. Um, and that, I think, might be where we start. So um, there are questions that are coming in from both the online audience and the audience here in, in Northside Baptist. Um, the instructions, again, if you go to slido.com and enter in the code, which I have to peek at quickly, it's 355-9886. You can see all the questions and submit your own. So the first one I wanted to, to highlight um, has to do with this idea of waking up and whether or not churches, synagogues, mosques um, are waking up and whether they recognize the rapidly changing landscape in the United States. How might you address congregational resistance and or apathy? I'm really after stimulating consciousness, becoming aware. And I think this is thoroughly Thurman, and, but Thurman is not alone. But what does it mean to become aware, not just of your external environment, but also your internal environment. Thurman was huge on meditation as a form of prayer, but meditation was meant to help us listen deeply to the subterranean wells and springs he believed that are already present for us. Our work was to wake up, to and to keep awake, he said. Uh, kind of a predecessor to some other language that has become politically volatile, but just know that being woke has been something that people have been talking about before recently. Uh, but how do we stay awake to what's happening deep here and how is it related to the outer? He's always asking the inner outer question. For congregations, for mosques, for temples, and for all forms of gatherings, Thurman thought it was important to create, this is my language, he calls them tools of the spirit. I call them aesthetic triggers. What is it that triggers consciousness? That you say, oh, I've been looking at that all along, and this is the first time I've seen it. That may not be your problem, but I have a real history of not being aware of what's in front of me. There was a guy years ago, I was in Nashville. He was retired, and he's probably my age now, and he had the most beautiful yard. And I would be out there pushing my lawnmower and saying, God, well, he's retired, and, and that's why his lawn looks so good. <laughs> And I had my son, who was maybe two or three years old, and I said, Clint, that's a nice yard over there, isn't it? I said, you see that big bush in his yard? 
the big red bush, Clinton? And Clint said, Dad, we have a red bush too. <laughs> I'd never seen it. <laughs> I was so focused on Mr. I think his name was Upchurch. I forgive me, Mr. Upchurch, wherever you are. Your, your beautiful lawn was beautiful, but I couldn't see my own beauty because I was so focused on yours. How do you stimulate consciousness, awareness of the other, but especially the other who is different, who is not you? Everybody in the world is not you. In fact, nobody in the world is you. People are different. And we will never understand the inherent dignity and worth of the other in all of her difference, in all of their difference, until we wake up. That's what I'm after. And I think that's what Thurman did better than anything else. He was able to stimulate consciousness, awareness of the spirit for those who need religion all the time. There are some people who need religion all the time. You know, I mean, I know y'all been, some of y'all been born, baptized, sanctified, the Holy Ghost, mighty burning fire. I'm not, I'm not putting you down. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that there's something deeper than language and words and symbols and signs, whatever your tradition is. There's something else Thurman thinks that is calling you. And you might miss it if you get stuck on symbols and signs and inherited traditions question is, what do you do with those traditions that help you to wake up? And I'm suggesting it's very urgent right now. <laughs> you might not want to sit around and just meditate forever. You might want to get up running. Um, there's a lot of great questions here to choose from. Um, here's, here's another one from Reverend Slayton. Dr. Ben Mays wrote that 11 a.m. on Sunday on Sunday morning was the most segregated hour in America. How and why has that remained true in an educated America? Maybe we're not human yet, Mr. Slaughter. Maybe we are not awake yet. Maybe we like being separated. Maybe it gives us a sense of privilege and power and domination over the other. And we get in our little segregated cubicles and rooms and buildings that we call houses of religion and we worship our little bitty old God in those little bitty old spaces and we like segregation. <laughs> Forgive me but it is funny. If you don't laugh you'll go crazy. Or you'll cry. Or you'll cry. But we love it. We love it. We love it. We love it because it makes us, it gives us some since Thurman's language is, it gives us some sense of identity. We seek identity often by pushing away the other. But there are a lot of historical reasons for that. It's not as simple as that. We inherit, we live in a habitus where we are being structured and structuring our consciousness. And maybe every now and then we, we get a look and we see how terrible this is. For those in Abrahamic traditions, this Isaiah passage where he looks and he sees the people and he gets sick on his stomach. And he said, oh, I'm a man undone. I am so messed up. <laughs> and I dwell, I even dwell among people who are messed up just like me. And then Isaiah gets his, commission in, you know, he has to go and do something about it. And he wakes up running. I had a long spiel in the lecture on running that was very poetic. Man, I'm so sad that I didn't get that. My ego was waiting for that moment. Oh, God. Preachers love that moment, you know. <laughs> there are, are several questions about democracy, and so I thought we'd go to a couple of those. How can we conjure a new idea of democracy in this moment when it feels like it needs renewal? Wow. Well, it won't be sitting down watching it on the news. First step, 
This is participant observer. This is running and watching. <laughs> and uh, we mentioned uh, William Barber. You know, he just got up running. I said, where did he come from? He just got up running. I was with Jesse Jackson, I mentioned to a group a few weeks ago, and he left. You know, when people get old, they become so wise when they are thinking still, you know. Not all people, because they get old, are wise. I don't mean to suggest that. In fact, it's the opposite for some. But, but Jesse is so wise. He said, we have great preachers now, but they don't know how to fight. Wow. And he, you know he's nonviolent. He's not talking about blood. He's, but they don't know how to confront evil. So busy, and by implication he meant, so busy becoming prosperous, so busy building mega temples to the glory of some kind of phallic symbol, ontological phallic symbol, piercing the heavens, but going to hell, and leaving our young people those most vulnerable in our society in a living hell. I see it everywhere. I don't know. It might not be in Baltimore. <laughs> but boy, everywhere else I go, it's just like hell. It's like, a, it's like a lake of fire that burns day and night forever and ever. And people are crying out for mercy. And we are arguing over who's right. Can I tell a story of my daddy or my pastor? Somebody told me this, but I forget it. But one of them told me. They said there was a, a, a barn that caught on fire, and there were two snakes in the barn. One snake had one head, and the other snake had 10 heads. And my dad would always say, now, which one got out? I'm going to ask you, which one got out? And the reason being? My, my daddy would always say, the one with one head got out because the other 10, the one with the 10 heads, they were all arguing over which way to go. <laughs> I, have, I push back on dad with that nowadays. I think it might be possible at some point if we take congregating, conjuring, and conspiring in commons together at crossings, we might learn how to communicate, connect, touch, feel, see the other. And we might go together. Somehow we got to go together. It won't be one great soul again. They may show up. They may be extraordinary. But even they, those whom we remember, had legions with them. So we, we got to figure out how to do this at the intersections. Was that the I, question? I forgot. You know, <laughs> I, it's close enough. It's close good, enough. Good, good. Um, to, to build off of that, to build off of what does it mean to meet at the intersections, we have a question coming in about um, your reference to Martin Buber. How do you think that Buber's notion of I, it, I, thou relationships could inform Thurman's vision for relationships in democracy? First, it did. And this idea of communitas, which Buber engineered in small community, is about relationality. And in other words, you can never be an it to me, and I still remain human. <laughs> I'm only human when you are thou. You are, I'm in relation, and this is a communitarian vision. And I encourage especially students, but I do it now, this work with different organizations. Communitarianism, relationality, is absolutely essential. But we need some other tools that go with that. When we talk about benevolence and justice and mercy and forgiveness, Abu Dhar was a quote I wanted to give tonight when uh, he reports that uh, the, the messenger, the prophet Muhammad, blessed be his name, when, when, when he told him, he said, 
when, and Allah is saying this to Muhammad, when, 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 when you come to me walking, I will run to you with forgiveness. This communitarian vision is powerful, but it needs some other tools. We've got to ask some hard questions about what is best when there's ambiguity and contingency. How does the communitarian vision speak to those dim places? And for those who dare to go into the world, wake up running, I'm suggesting to you at the intersection where worlds are colliding, that you also learn how to negotiate the traffic because it's a very dangerous intersection. And it's one thing to have a communitarian vision and not live long enough to see any of it realized. These are very dangerous intersections we're in. So if you're gonna run, make sure you take somebody with you. <laughs> it's, it's important that this community goes as we conspire, goes together. I'm not sure we're gonna get any more saviors and uh, you know, if they do come, I would be suspect. But I do believe that we, if we join just a few of us, it's amazing how powerful we would be. And I'm thinking specifically about interreligious practices around democratic space, around one particular ethical concern, poverty or poverty in this local community or changing the traffic light. It can be that simple. But when we make a covenant with the other, then we bring out the other tools and go to work. And we have so many gifted people in our community whose tools we never use because we fail to come together. Now we know this, but that's not, again, that's not Baltimore, is it? That's, you guys getting this done? We've got some work to do. We've got a little work to do. A little work to do. I know in Atlanta, we're having a hard time with that. Um. There's a couple other comments here that are, are playing around with some of, of Thurman's thought and the aliveness of life, which I want to I want to go to that question. How can we experience the aliveness of life in our current cultural atmosphere? Wow. Man, they handed me that question. <laughs> Everybody knows this quote from Thurman now, right? Don't ask, somebody could complete that, right? Don't ask what the world can do for you. Is that it? Ask what you can do the world. Yeah, I'm thinking of John Kennedy or somebody. Yeah. <laughs> can somebody else help me with that? Let me see. Nobody knows that quote? Oprah Winfrey knows it hands down. Thurman made that, don't ask again, let's say it loud. What the world needs are people who have come alive. A young doctoral student who was studying at the Graduate Theological Union uh, years ago came to Thurman in his office and asked him what he should do. What does the world need? And he says, would you say that again? Can somebody remember that on the other side of the thing? <laughs> what did he say? You know, old people always say, huh? <laughs> what did he say? Good God, Gil Bailey was the student. He later wrote a book uh, entitled Humanity at the Crossroads. But it just, what makes you come alive? 
and we can experience aliveness. Thurman says that once the mind is committed and disciplines of the spirit, people who like to read, actually, uh, the first discipline is commitment. And he says that when the mind, when the will, is focused on one thing, kind of like Kierkegaard, purity of heart is to will one thing. He says the very vitality of the universe becomes available at your disposal. And, and here's the interesting thing about coming alive. This is for especially the people who are in the digital world. He says that the same process of commitment that brings vitality and energy when there's commitment works both ways. The same thing that makes strawberries grow also makes poison ivy grow. So if your commitment to come alive is rooted in something that is, has a higher purpose of excellency, a larger value than you and your self-interest, if it's for the care and the nurture of the other, especially the vulnerable, he believes it'll come to pass in some form or the other. That's, the, that's kind of in the Bible, too, in my Bible. But, that's, but I won't bore you with that. The idea is you can also get a Mussolini because of commitment. And I suspect, and Thurman says this again in this expo exposition of Habakkuk, right? Got it right? He says that why is it that the spiritual people seem to be more scattered and dissipated in their energies than those who are interested in evil enterprises? <laughs> Boy, if you don't see that today, man, I'm, well, well, at least that's what I see. But I'm not calling any names. But it's amazing, speaking of democratic space, how we, we are just held, you know, by, by the others uh, who are doing some other things that are very interesting, and we're dissipated. That's enough of that, though. I, I go down the road that I don't need to go. Uh -huh. God, for, God forgive us for our sins and our many new sins. Amen to that. I, I want to think about the idea of running a little bit more with you. Um, and this is a, a question coming from me and not from the, the many questions that we have um, from the audience. Running and, and the vision that you're presenting is clearly like an endurance sport, right? It's something, it's a discipline, it's something that you have to get up every day and do, and you've got to work towards like it. Fatima. Yes, like Fatima. Um, and I'm just wondering what you do for rest in this instance, and how you sort of recharge so that you can be in the race for the long haul. You know, you're just giving me this stuff. It, that was in my a little, uh, all those pages. I've never been able to tailor a lecture. I've been in places like this. I just stop in the middle and go and walk down the aisle and talk to people because I just run and do oh, so many words. There's so many words. Some people are better at. But in the in, again in this exposition on Habakkuk, Thurman talks about the principle of alternation. It's a, it's a persistent theme for Thurman, the need to run and rest. There, while the prophet is running, the prophet also needs to find respite. Man, what a word. So I'm running, but I'm also contemplative. And Thurman calls this the waiting moment. He even has a meditation by that name. What do we do in the stillness, in the waiting moment? Finding the time, the space in your own life where you're quiet enough to maybe hear your own voice. It's a scary thing. I've tried it a few times. It's very scary because some of the stuff I hear is kind of frightening. <laughs> or the memories, the things. The, I don't need to go and see a horror show. There's some stuff going down on underneath the surface 
that I'm not aware of until I quiet down. And it has to do with our quest for justice. I mean, we're running for justice and compassion, but there are so many things that we need to repair here, that we unresolve contradictions in our own lives. And the deep-seated rage. You know, since I'm over 70 now, I feel like I can say things in public, especially when my wife is not with me. So this is good. When I was a young pastor, I was so angry. I had no idea I was angry. I thought I was doing the Lord's will. I would preach at these little people in the congregation. <laughs> <laughs> you maybe you've never seen that, but these preachers, at least that's the way I remember. They all told me I was a nice guy and stuff. But I there was a seething rage because of so many contradictions that were unresolved. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Need I say more? Running is just in my DNA. <laughs> I I ran so much growing up from danger that when we were drafted in the military and we had to do the run, dodge, and jump, everybody from the south side of Chicago broke records. <laughs> <laughs> running, but running in fear, in, in this stalking fear that always around the corner there was something waiting for you. Many of us live our lives that way. It's maybe it's not another gang banger or anything like that, but you know, this fear. So, so, it shows up in our actions, in our public demonstrations, ministrations. It shows up. So the quiet time, that's why I'm going back to waiting. He has another way of talking about it. He calls it waiting. Waiting means to wait and negotiate the time interval between wish and fulfillment. You're negotiating the time interval. You have this desire, this wish, and you want it to be instant. I used to, students, I always, especially working on a dissertation, you say, hey, 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 this, this won't happen in, in one year. <laughs> Not two years. <laughs> you know, it won't happen like that unless you are, you know, some kind of genius, but most of us are not. But you have to negotiate the time interval, which means there's some serious discipline around listening, looking, learning, and being still long enough to maybe pick up the scent, especially wrestling with vocation. Some of us know that too well, right? For who am I? He had, Thurman had three questions. Who am I is the first question in the quiet you need to ask. He'd always say, who am I really? Two, what do I really want? Some of us are probably 60 or 70, and you're still trying to figure that out. But what do I really want? And what do I want all the time? This insatiable hunger that I need to fulfill, to name and to feel satisfied. Why am I so, who am I is a question of identity. What do I want is a question of purpose, calling. The third question for Thurman is, how do I get what I want? <laughs> and that's the hardest because that's the ethical question. Do I get what I want? by taking it from the other or some form of idolatry. I create these strange things that I worship. <laughs> you know, it goes on and on with him, but it's a, what do I really want and how do I get it? They're all the same question after a while, but that's, that's Thurman's recommendation too. Was that the answer to the question, though? I was just talking. <laughs> it was. Okay. Um, please join me in thanking Dr. Fluker for tonight's lecture.
Thank you all for being with us tonight. Um, we'll be having cookies and coffee and conversation and conspiring and maybe even a little conjuring um, in the fellowship hall afterwards. So please join us there. Um, I want to also say that if you signed up for this lecture, you'll get a copy of the video when it um, gets edited relatively shortly, and you'll also get a survey, and if you could fill that out for us, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we've got a lot of great things happening at ICJS. Uh, my colleague Ben Sachs is uh, teaching a mini course um, on anti-Semitism undefined. Um, my colleague uh, Christine Krieger is uh, teaching Thurman's seminal work, Jesus and the Disinherited, in a, a book group, so you can join us for that. And then finally, my um, uh, colleague Matt Taylor has a, a new book published called Scripture People, Salafi Muslims and Evangelical Christians America, mm -hmm. and he's going to be having an event on November 9th for that. Um, so please um, join us in the next couple of weeks. Um, and if you're not on our newsletter, um, you can sign up at icjs.org. All of our programs are, are free and uh, made available to the public because of generosity um, of donors um, and the vision of our donors. And so we always want to recognize them. And finally, we invite um, those of you to join us for more conversation this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fluker. I didn't want to say this all night. Oh. Let there be light. <laughs>